Hello everyone, welcome to another Live at Five with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I am your host, curator Kevin Adkisson, uh, and today I want to talk about something that is pretty fascinating that I don't know that much about, uh, but is a much larger research project that hopefully maybe this summer or fall I can dig into, and that is the uh, collection of architectural fragments and sort of spolia is what we call it that was placed all around Cranbrook's campus in the 1920s. So I hope uh, that you'll be interested in the story today of how some of these objects got here. But when I say I don't know much about it, I don't know a lot about the individual works of art that we're going to be looking at. So I'll show you um, maybe 20 pieces, but I don't know too much about the individual works of art. So I am here right now. to have his studio there. This is where Eliel Saarinen and many of his young architects from Michigan designed all of Cranbrook was behind these windows. At the other end of the building, you see the windows here led into the first art museum. era. Uh, and this was part of a collection of artworks that were purchased on a tr uh, mission of George Booth's to collect educational architectural fragments. Um, and so what are these fragments? We would probably call them spolia. And the term spolia comes from the Latin for spoils. And there are sort of two types of spolia. Uh, you can have spolia that are just building fragments. So think of uh, Roman temples or, or even uh, Renaissance churches that would use Roman columns. Uh, you can think about Roman architecture that used Greek fragments. Um, you can think about the Arch of Constantine in Rome, which is from the sort of late antiquity and is made up of early antiquity carvings. And uh, even think about when Constantinople, when the heart of the Roman Empire moved, they actually packed up Roman sculpture and took it to Constantinople as this sort of um, argument that they were the new Rome. And so you have spolia as this ancient practice, though they would not have called it spolia. That's a 16th century term. And it has sort of two ideas behind it. There's both the ideological role of spolia, which is it is a spoil of war. Um, it, it's sort of the booty of the conquered. Um, or you can think of it ideologically as a revival of the empire. Why does Washington, D.C. look Roman? Well, because we are the new uh, sort of empire. We are the new Rome. And so there's the ideological aspect of spolia, and then there's the pragmatic aspect of spolia. Why go out of town and start a new quarry if you can just chisel apart an older Roman or Etruscan building and use the same materials in your structure? Now, 
When you're talking about spolia that is from 15th century Italy, uh, and it's here in Bloomfield Hills, we're not really getting uh, sort of pragmatic spolia here. There are no Cranbrook buildings that were cheaper to build by using ancient materials. Instead, we're hooked to another sort of ideological train of thought, but one very different from sort of war and conquering. And it's this idea that uh, ancient works of art and architecture could teach the next generation of art and architecture. And so George Booth had the idea in the summer of 1926 that he needed to start a collection of ancient architectural fragments. Uh, and so he was looking for someone who could do this, this shopping spree for him. And he was introduced through Eliel Saarinen to one of Eliel Saarinen's oldest friends, Gustav Strengel. Gustav Strengel had been a student of Eliel Saarinen at the Polytechnic, or, or maybe a classmate. Um, he was uh, three or four years younger than Saarinen. And so they knew each other in the 1880s. Strengel worked for Eliel Saarinen in the 1890s. In 1904, Gustav Strengel actually tanked Eliel Saarinen's first design for the Helsinki railway station. Strengel was an architect, an author, a sort of curator, museum director, and he was all about sort of rational design and architecture. So he was uh, one of the uh, sort of went from the Art Nouveau to the arts and crafts to modernism before his death in 1937. But beyond just teaching, writing, and he wrote a lot of books, including early sort of histories of Alvar Aalto and Scandinavian uh, modernism. But beyond that, in 1926, he accepted this commission from George Booth to head out to Italy for six months, buying $10,000 worth of ancient architectural fragments for the new Cranbrook collection. And so if we look at the fragment, we'll start with this piece of, uh, of an architrave, I think, um, architectural ornament here on all sides. I really don't know what this piece is, and they're unlabeled in the collection, and I don't speak Italian to check the, the main receipt, which is why I say there's more research to be done. When George Booth invited Gustav Strengel to become his agent in Italy, purchasing these pieces, George Booth said he has no specifics in mind about what he wants, but they need to be at least 100 years old, they need to be inspirational, and they need to suggest a fine type of architectural expression. George Booth actually thought of these spolia, these pieces, as helping to interpret photographs. And so he thought that students who would come to um, Cranbrook and study might never have been to Italy. And so he wanted, he said, he told Strangel, I have a, um, I have a very, large collection of books, prints, and photographs. However, uh, I don't have individual works of sculpture. And so he wanted these to actually augment the collection of books and photographs and sort of provide that detail to the student who may never have been to Italy. Now, George Booth said he really was not concerned about what it was. He wanted it to be inspirational first and foremost. And he thought that Professor Saarinen would uh, have comments as to what was an advisable selection. And so Gustav Strengel, he sets out from Helsinki in October of 1926. He reaches Rome. He has his money from George Booth. He's staying uh, near the Vatican. He runs into a number of people who help him, including a German dealer, uh, Mr. Otto, who was the one of the most respected dealers of antiquities. Another, Dr. Ludwig Pollock, who was a scholar of antiquities. And these people sort of helped him avoid buying fakes, making sure that he got great deals. Um, he... In letters back to Cranbrook, here we're seeing this interesting assemblage, and I'm not sure who's responsible for mounting these. Uh, Strangel wrote detailed notes to George Booth about how the Italians used spolia on their buildings. 
I'm not sure that this is exactly how they would have done it, but it's interesting. As Strangel, he had six months to do this. George Booth wanted everything ready by the summer of 1927. And what's interesting uh, is before Strangel left Finland to go and purchase start purchasing these pieces of spolia. And most of these are marble from the 15th or 16th century, though there are some Roman columns. This is Roman from the second century AD, and it's now on a new Saarinen designed column. So you have the Roman spolia up at the top, and then you have the modern uh, column below it. Before uh, Strangel set sail for or, or went over land, I did not set sail, most likely, from Finland to Italy. Before he went to Italy, uh, he was introduced to the Count Emilio Pagliano, who was the Italian minister of Finland, and Sarnen Strangel and the minister, Italian minister had a long discussion about the Cranbrook ideal. And uh, then the Roman authorities wrote letters of support from the Ministry of Artists, the Bel Artisti, uh, to introduce Gustav Strangel to the four so-called kings of antiquity, who were the dealers in Rome who controlled the sort of most important pieces and the largest architectural fragments. What Strangel realized as he started out his buying, by November he wrote back to George Booth saying, I have to start buying in bulk because you have to have a substantial line of receipts in order to open up what he called the inner sanctum of these kings of antiquities. And he learned this from Dr. Otto and from Dr. Pollock, uh, who realized that in order to get into the, the inner sanctums and these sort of dens of antiquities, uh, he would need to have this established reputation as a large purchaser of antiquities. And so that's what Strangel began doing, and doors began opening up, and eventually he sent 78 pieces back here to America. Here is another uh, three or four spiral colonnettes. So these are twisted um, or screw form columns. These are from uh, around 1500. Byz Byzantine fragments. These are in Rosso Antico, which is Italian red antique marble. And you see how Sarnen incorporated them quite beautifully into this wall with the sort of larger arch and then the smaller arch and then the beauty arch, which is all new construction here. Now, after Strangel had made his purchase, and, and there are more fragments down in the school for boys, but I'm going to head back up and show you some more inside the first academy building. After Strangel had made his purchase, he had to get them out of Italy, and that was really when his friend Dr. Otto, the Berlin dealer, helped the most. Um, all of the pieces had to be packed up from around uh, Rome, Naples, Florence, where he had purchased the pieces, and then they had to be taken to the uh, Roman Ministry of Arts, the authorities, in order to be cleared to leave the country. And you'll see in here another fragment, this time on a base, and it, it has this sort of today rather minor position within the administration building, um, but it would have Deployment of architectural fragments around existing doors. And so you see how Saarinen worked this fragment into his uh, building, or I guess this might not have been Saarinen yet. And so you see how the students would come, they could study architecture upstairs in the library, and then they could see sort of the history of architecture and learn about, I don't know, this looks... 16th, 15th, 16th century stone carving as they headed into the Cranbrook Architectural Office. Now, we'll see out here, there's more, and if it seems like there's a lot, there are 78 pieces that came from Strangel's purchase. So here is a um, 
I really have no idea what this is, but again, Italian marble piece. Now, when it came time to shipping these back to America, the Italians were very concerned about provenance and about um, how things were leaving the country. And so everything had to be packed up, shipped to the Ministry of Arts in Rome, where then it was unpacked and checked. And the Italian authorities would examine it for uh, what exactly was leaving the country and also uh, make sure that you were being honest with what you had purchased. And then if what you purchased they felt should remain in Italy, the Italian authorities had the chance to buy it uh, for the price that you said you purchased it for. And this became a bit of an issue because Strangel had $10,000 for his housing, his travel to Italy, any type of commission he was going to make, what he had to pay Dr. Otto, Dr. Pollock, $10,000 tax on everything. And so you could try and lowball the Italian government and say you paid less, uh, and that was sometimes done. Or if you didn't want the Italian government to Okay, I think I'm back. There's so many dead spots on campus. These walking tours uh, can be dangerous. And so eventually they arrived here in April of 1927, and George Booth had them unpacked somewhere on this campus that was largely not built up to that point. And Saarinen and George Booth studied the pieces. They also studied Dr. Pollock's and Gustav Strangel's notes on the pieces, which are in archives, this huge, beautiful booklet that documents all of these pieces of architectural spolia. And then Saarinen had to incorporate them into his buildings. And he did this not only in the earliest structures of 1928, but he was still doing it as late as 1938, 39, when he built the painting studios, which have these three beautiful pieces of spolia. So here you see a 15th century marble fragment from a pilaster. So from a, a, a engaged column in the wall, I love the sort of triton there. And then the sort of botanic form scrolling out. Here you have a 15th century or a 13th century coat of arms. And I've never really given this much attention until I was preparing for today's tour. Um, but you do have the initials of whoever's coat of arms these are, L-V-A-R. And then you have bird claws and bird wings, but no bird. And I love the way that the bricks are sort of scroll cut around the shield. And then up here, another 15th century piece in terracotta. And the bird, unfortunately, has been knocked off somehow. It was there when it was built on the wall. Um, so you see the bird's wings and it was an eagle looking this direction. And then down here you see the dolphins and the shell. A really beautiful work of terracotta. And if you look at how Saarinen deployed them, it's this very sort of blank wall within the spolia placed within it. And I do think it makes me think of my trips to Italy and seeing how architectural fragments are placed around uh, sort of different buildings and all throughout Italy. Now, Mr. St Strangel, uh, he completes this, the purchases by December of 1926. He had six months, but he did it in three because he was worried that the Italian government, there were rumors going around that they would raise the taxes on exports again. And so he wanted to complete Mr. Booth's work in just three months. 
He also uh, was fairly ill while he was there and he wanted to get back to Finland. And as I read more about Gustav Strangel and just the prolificness of his writing about architecture and about uh, sort of criticism and advancing Scandinavian design, this seems like such a strange part of his career, this sort of four month journey to purchase architectural fragments for a man he has never met for this idea of a community. However, he was an excellent advocate for Cranbrook in Italy. His letters and his introductions to different uh, government officials and different dealers really put, paint an interesting story about trying to get uh, in the 1920s this unique collection of architectural fragments and sculptures. A little bit more about his relationship with Cranbrook and with Eliel Saarinen. I mentioned that in 1904 he tanked Saarinen's initial design for the Helsinki Central Station. The station that we know and love, which was completed in the 19-teens, is entirely indebted to the fact that Strangel panned the initial design and Saarinen was forced through public pressure to redesign the structure in a more modern fashion. That, however, did not stop the friendship of the two men, obviously. And in 1923, after Eliel Saarinen had come in second place in the Chicago Tribune Tower competition and was using his funds from Louis Sullivan to immigrate from Finland to America, who came over with him? Not before Loya, before the children came to America, it was Eliel Saarinen and Gustav Strangel in January of 1923. Eliel Saarinen only spoke German, Finnish, Swedish, Russian, and French, and so Strangel spoke those languages, Hungarian and uh, English, and so Strangel served as the English translator for the two men while they were here in America. And then later on, uh, Eliel Saarinen told Gustav Strangel's daughter, Marianne, one day you will come to Cranbrook and you will, you will work with us there. And in 1937, she did just that. that. Uh, Marianne Strangel, the daughter of Anna and Gustav, she was born in 1909, so she's right between the Saarinen's two children of 1905 and 1910. She studied weaving at the uh, Finnish Society of Crafted Design, which her father was the uh, president and one of the founders of. And in 1937, she came to teach weaving here at Cranbrook underneath Loya Saarinen. And in 1942, she took over the weaving department and she ran that until 1961. So those of you who know the name Strangel, you probably know Marianne, not her father, Gustav. Of course, she was deeply involved in the industry, the auto industry, and I've heard it said that you can't get into an American car from the 50s that doesn't have the touch of Marianne Strangel because so many of her students left the weaving department here and went to work for the auto industry. She married an American architect. They, she lived until 1998 in Wellfleet, Massachusetts, uh, and so the family's legacy does remain here in America, like so many of the immigrant artists that we talk about when we, have, when we talk about the Cranbrook story. I hope this was interesting for you all. Like I said at the beginning, I think there's so much more to be learned about these objects. Uh, in the archives, we have the receipts, we have the dealer notes, we have where they're from, we have uh, all sorts of details, many of which are in Italian that need to be attached back to the individual objects. And I do think that they serve a purpose here of teaching and of inspiring the artist and those who are visiting and walking around. Thanks so much for joining me for another Live at Five with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I'll be back on Instagram Live on Thursday at five o'clock. And then tomorrow on Facebook, on the Center for Collections and Research Facebook group, I'll be coming live from the girls' middle school. Um, if you have requests, if you have other questions, feel free to send them to me uh, as a message. I don't always see your... Um, I don't always see your messages when you send them as a uh, typed here. So if you have pressing concerns, please send me a message. I'm happy to respond. And I'll see you all next Thursday, live at five from Cranbrook. Thanks so much.